Hello, everyone, and welcome to Word Up. Uh, we have Word Up acknowledged that some of us are situated on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg and Huron Wendat people. Word Up is dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture and are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Metis, and Inuit people. Uh, I ask that you mute yourselves until we open up for questions uh, and hang in there for open mic where you've got an opportunity to share your work. Uh, so tonight, we have a writers and research panel. We are joined by the fourth Poet Laureate of Toronto uh, from 2012 to 2015, and the seventh Parliamentary Canadian Poet Laureate, George Elliott Clark, uh, theater artist, actor, director, dramaturge, and educator, Leah Holder, and history teacher and, the, and author, Clint Lavelle. Uh, so no matter your genre, whether it's sci-fi, historically based fiction, or nonfiction, a writer has to research. We talk to these established authors to know uh, how they organize their research and where and who they find their answers from. So each of you will have five minutes to introduce yourself. So who would like to start off? Maybe ladies first, Leah? Sure, yeah, I can go first. Uh, hi there, my name is Leah Holder and I'm coming to you from Toronto, which is the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee people. And we uh, live on land that is Treaty 13 and the Williams Treaty. Um, I'm originally from New Brunswick, which is the land of the Mi'kmaq as well as um, some other um, uh, groups as well. Um, I, as, as Linda said, I ha I'm a multi-hyphenate. I do all of the things and then that's what keeps me employed. So I am an actor and a theater director and a writer and an educator. I, I mostly work in new work, uh, new theater work, which means that I work as a dramaturg as well, which is uh, an editor for plays or a crafter for, for theater work. So I work uh, as a director in close proximity with, with the writers. Uh, and then I am a writer myself as well. Um, as I said, I was originally from New Brunswick, so I moved to Ontario to attend theater school. Uh, right now, I work for Theater by the Bay in Barrie as education and creation coordinator. Um, and I've done a variety of things for Theater by the Bay as well. I've worn all the hats, again, to keep me employed. Uh, and right now, as the education and creation coordinator, I facilitate our new work programs. Uh, which are the theater lab, as well as our professional workshop series and our spark sessions. Uh, before I was an actor and before I uh, moved to Toronto, I come from a family that is um, really keenly interested or borderline obsessed with history and with uh, uh, genealogy and with the ancestry of, of where we've come from. And so from a really early age, I was uh, always um, enamored with and, and uh, with, with the stories of our family and, and where we'd come from and, and kind of what had happened to these previous generations. Um, and so when I went to university, I studied history as well as English with a concentration in drama. So for my career, I have always put those two things together. The work that I love best is, is the work that has a historical perspective and the, the theater work and the writing work that, that is investigating where we as, as a society and as a people have come from, whether that's 20 years ago or 50 or 100. Um, I, I really love focusing on that, focusing through that, that lens of, of history, which as per the panel involves a lot of research <laughs> and a lot of reading and a lot of uh, picking through those sources to, to find how to tell our story best. Um, some, uh, the work that I'll kind of be talking about tonight, kind of the, again, the lens through which I'm going to look at research would be some of the work I've done for Theatre by the Bay. So as a director dramaturg, I worked on two, uh, historical plays with them. The, uh, We Must Have More Men, which, uh, was Barry in the Great War and looked at the, the real true, um, Barry soldiers who who went to World War One, and and that story was fictionalized and enhanced by the writers Danielle Kostrich and Alex Doe. And then I also directed and dramaturged the Cenotaph Project, uh, which is written by Danielle, uh, based on the research of our other panelist Clint Lovell and his book. So it really ties together very nicely. 
So that's some of the work I've done is in, in uh, director dramaturg uh, land. And then uh, a few years ago for Theatre by the Bay, I wrote the play Mary of Shanty Bay, which is uh, based on the, the real diaries of Mary Sophia Gapper, who came to Canada in 1828 as a 30-year-old spinster who thought her life was over because she was, wasn't married at 30. And uh, she came from England and came, came to Canada uh, for what she thought was going to be a year-long adventure, a chance to see her brothers who lived here, a little, you know, look around the, the colony before she then had to go back to England, where she was going to be a governess for her sister. And she arrived here and the country really opened up for her. And she suddenly found someone new to be while here, and she wrote it all down at the time. So she sent letters back and forth to her family in England and kept a, a very lengthy diary, which is held at the Archives of Ontario and which somebody had edited in the 60s. Um, and so I, I used that text as the foundation for my play, Mary of Shanty Bay, uh, which uh, Theatre by the Bay produced in 2018 and which is coming back in the fall of 2022. So this is your, your sneak peek into, into future, uh, future show as well. Um, I think that that's, that's enough about me. George, do you want to go next? A five, in, five minute introduction? Oh, sure. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm very, very pleased to be part of tonight's uh, panel. So interested to know that um, uh, uh, folks in Barry, uh, writers and artists and, and uh, uh, citizens in general are so interested in history and the archives and doing research to bring various stories to life. Uh, I am a poet. I've also uh, written plays, uh, also a screenplay, which was produced. The plays have all been produced except one. Also opera libretti. The operas were all have all been produced, three of them. Uh, and, and uh, I've been publishing uh, poetry in, in book form since uh, 1983, which is almost 40 years now that I've, I have a track, a track record of publishing um, uh, books of poetry and as well as other things, novels. I've got two novels out as well. But the important point to make here, and I'm also a professor of English University of Toronto, so professionally I do a lot of research anyway in terms of my scholarship. So the real point I need to make is, is that research has always been of profound importance to me because history is of profound importance to me. I don't really know why, except for the fact that um, I was born in Nova Scotia, raised in Halifax, and, and my mom was a teacher. Um, she had a teacher's uh, college certificate. And my dad was a self-taught autodidact intellectual. And he was particularly interested in history. He'd been a paper boy in Halifax during World War II, and he saved the papers. And he liked to save a lot of other magazines and ephemera uh, that would end up in our household. And, and he would clip uh, items from the paper and save them and so on. And we often had a lot of conversations about events political events uh, going on in the 1960s when I was a, a boy growing up. Um, and so I think I may have probably caught that history bug from him. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of my earliest memories truly is the assassination of John F. Kennedy, November 22, 1963. I was three and a half. But I remember that day very well because my father took me downtown in his pickup truck. And he bothered to explain to me why everyone was so somber, why everyone was so upset uh, in Halifax, and in fact, managed to explain the fact of death to me, of mortality to me as a three and a half year old, by asking me to study the leaves that were still on the trees and those that were falling, and explaining the life cycle to me using autumn leaves on, on such an, uh, a grave occasion. Uh, so I grew up with a, a sense of needing to know history to be grounded. And as someone who's Black, someone who's partly historical, African-Canadian, Africadian, to use my word, community, coming out of Nova Scotia, uh, by the time I became a teenager, I really had to understand why my community 
uh, faced uh, and still faces uh, so much discrimination and prejudice and marginalization and, and police misconduct and so on and so forth. Why? And of course, that meant understanding the history of the African uh, slave trade, how that created the West, how it created modernity. Because if you think about it, uh, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the three great uh, forces that created the modern world, even, even the idea of globalization, came out of uh, the economic and technological progress that mass enslavement of Africans in the New World, so-called New World, enabled. Uh, their captivity enabled the rise of Western Europe, uh, Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, the Netherlands in particular, and their rise to global prominence, and then along with them, the United States, and to a lesser extent, Canada. But all of these nations, uh, the northern half of the globe, which is still the most prosperous part of the planet, got that way because of the African slave trade and imperialism and colonialism. If I come back to my own personal history and genealogy, how do I get to Nova Scotia? How did my ancestors get there? Easy. Uh, War of 1812. Uh, the British uh, liberated uh, African uh, uh, enslaved people uh, and from the uh, Chesapeake Bay area, Maryland and Virginia, uh, in the United States, and, and moved 2,200 of, of my ancestors, uh, Black and Indigenous, Cherokee, to Nova Scotia, uh, where my maternal ancestors settled in 1813. When I say settle, I really mean they, they were placed upon land that was impossible to farm deliberately to ensure that they would become a lumpen proletariat. You always got to use a Marxist term, everybody, at least once in a while. You got to throw a little bit of Marx. So the government of Nova Scotia, the colonial government, deliberately constructed the black community of Nova Scotia to be a lumpen proletariat, a situation which was maintained until the 1960s when a first major wave of black activism in Nova Scotia began to change all that. So I'm someone who has indigenous heritage, as well as, of course, uh, um, uh, black African heritage uh, via the United States, but also via Jamaica, where I have a, I had a paternal, my paternal grandfather was Jamaican, and he was a sailor who was able to come to Canada despite the anti-black immigration laws uh, in the 1930s because he was a porter uh, for the railway. And if you were a porter for the railway, you were allowed to come to Canada as a black male, so long as you would perform that particular uh, service function. So I'll stop there because I know we've got plenty to talk about. How are we doing with uh, Clint? Has he been able to join us yet? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. I think it's a problem in the neighborhood here, but I think we're okay. Excellent. Glad you could join us. So you're actually perfect timing because we're you're we're just doing introductions and it's your turn. Oh, okay. Uh, my name's Clint Lovell. Uh, generally, I'm on time to work. Uh, the reason I'm here this evening, I suppose, is because of uh, a couple of books I put out, uh, Boys from Barry, and uh, Regret to Inform You. And these grew out of a teaching project that I had been doing with my students over uh, many years, where we uh, researched and uh, told the stories of local soldiers uh, who were killed in the First and Second World Wars. And uh, the project evolved into, uh, uh, well, the students expressed their research in print. It evolved into a book of three editions, a second book, as well as online work, radio, a documentary, uh, plays, and other uh, things. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I just had to unmute. I was, uh, um, so thank okay. you. So, so Linda, are you, uh, do you want me to take over now? Should we go move into our, hold on a second. Oh, Linda just told yes. me. Oh, she's back. Okay. We're having lots of tech problems tonight. Yeah, we've been freezing up. So I've been messaging Colleen here as the backup. Well, <laughs> yeah, Colleen. Me. It's not just me. No, no. Oh. So um, how bad, Colleen? 
Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you all for your introductions. Um, I've sent you all the questions that we're going to discuss beforehand to give you an idea what we want to talk about. Um, I'm actually uh, excited about the fact that we're talking about research and we're talking about history tonight simply because I've actually, with everything that's going on currently in the world, I've been thinking a lot about history lately and about past and experiences and whatnot. So it's, it's kind of apropos that we're having this topic this week. So thank you again for all for coming. Um, what I want to do is I'll just go uh, through the question. Each of you will get a chance to speak, but we like to keep it fairly informal. So feel free to jump in if you have an opinion or want to add something and we'll keep it quite informal. And then uh, for, people, for the audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or you can save it to the end when we have you know, a question period, um, whatever way you are most comfortable with doing. So with no further ado, um, I might switch up the order of the questions, so don't get confused if we skip around a bit, but why don't we start with, so what are the different approaches to research? Does one type fit better with a certain type of writing, i.e. fiction versus nonfiction? Um, and Leah, why don't you start? Sure. I, I had to look at my notes, Linda, because you, you jumped into a second question right away. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of, of different approaches to research, the, the thing that I was really thinking about in answer to this question is the difference between primary sources and secondary sources. So, you know, as a, as a historian, the primary source is the, is the real voice of the person who saw and experienced the thing or the event or the or the whatever. So th those are your diaries, um, sometimes, sometimes your historic newspapers, but sometimes those are secondary sources. Um, the, the, the words, thoughts, the, the video recording, the audio recording of, of someone um, talking about the thing or the event or whatever it is as they saw it. Um, so there's primary sources, there's secondary sources, which is the, the, the people who are commenting and critiquing and talking about the primary source or talking about the person who, who saw the thing and did the thing um, so that it's a bit removed from the primary source. It sometimes has an opinion on it. It sometimes has a, an agenda. It has a, a reason for its creation. Um, which is something to know and embrace with all those sources. Um, so I was thinking about those two uh, pillars of, of research. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking about is the places you go for research. I think we all are familiar with the internet. Uh, so, you know, the internet exists, libraries exist, archives exist. Um, and a lot of those resources to go, you know, the, the approach is, is free. Um, which is amazing or, or affordable. And then uh, the other approach to research is uh, the physical going to of the place where the thing happened. Um, and this is one of my favorite kinds of research is, uh, is, is kind of land-based, I guess. So if I'm, I, Mary of Shanty Bay had a, starts in the historic village of Thornhill. And so it was really important for me to go to Thornhill and walk up and down the streets walk up the big hill so that I can talk about how Mary would have would have done that, see the, the churches that are there, the graveyard. And there's always new questions that that emerge from from that kind of a, a research. Um, so I think those are the the approaches that I think about. And to me, they are the same for fiction or nonfiction, just kind of how you're going to use them might be different. Um, but you know for for nonfiction, you're, you're still putting it through then the, your lens of yourself. So you still need to figure out what your opinion on the thing is and you have to go there. Great, I think that's what I want to say. <laughs> that's excellent. I love the putting it through your lens. Maybe we'll come back, back to that later, but um, uh, George, do you want to go next? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, Aaliyah for the answer that she just gave. Um, and I'll just build on that by, by saying that, uh, talk about my first novel, how that came about. Um, my mom was, uh, uh, sick and, 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 uh, essentially suffering from dementia, uh, in 1994, when I was 34 years old. 
and I had just begun to teach in the United States. And I came back to Halifax, and she was living with my aunt, who was taking care of her, her sister. And I went to visit her, and, and we were having toast and tea on a sunny day in May 1994, when my mother looked at me, looked up from her tea, and said, blurted out, you know you have two cousins who were hanged. Um, and of course, it was the first time I'd heard of it. I was 34 years old. I'd never, I'd never heard of this story. So I immediately went to my aunt, who was right there, and said, what is this all about? Two, we, I have two cousins who were hanged? And my aunt said, yeah. And, and uh, so I heard this information on a Friday morning. Within uh, just over 48 hours, a couple days later, a cousin of mine gave me an actual newspaper clipping from uh, May 1949, about the fact that my mom's first cousins, my second cousins, George and Rufus Hamilton, uh, had been condemned to death to be executed by hanging in Fredericton, New Brunswick on July 27, 1949. Uh, so I went from knowing nothing about it to actually having an actual newspaper clipping about, the, about uh, their case, their situation, and I knew immediately, as soon as my mother had blurted out this information, which had been a long-kept repressed family secret, uh, that I would write a novel about it. It would, be, it would be fiction, but it would be based on a nonfiction. I had to recover these guys' bodies. I had to. They were 22 and 23 years old when they died. And the reason uh, why they were executed is they had committed a robbery of a taxi driver in Fredericton. And in the context of doing that, uh, had slugged him in the back of the head with a hammer, causing his death. And and uh, they had destroyed evidence. They got about $200 uh, for their troubles, for their criminal act uh, that night. Um, and, and they were apprehended mainly because one of the brothers, George, um, after whom I am, in fact, slightly named, um, uh, went to the police and confessed that his brother did it. Uh, at which point the RCMP arrested both of them. So, and of course, they had their trials and they were condemned and executed. They were hanged back to back uh, in, the, in the barn and back the Fredericton City Jail. But to get to the point, the research, uh, I knew I was going to write a novel about, about this matter because I could remember my, they were 22 and 23 when they died, and I could remember myself as a teen and as a young man in my 20s feeling alienated feeling angry, never to the point, because I'm just not capable of any kind of violence, I'm happy to say, but I knew what it felt like to be marginalized and alienated because of race, because of racism. And I needed to understand that because that was uh, also the era in which my parents grew up, including, of course, my father. And and uh, so I want to try to understand their milieu. So that meant going back to the 1930s, 1940s, uh, Nova Scotia, Black Nova Scotia, uh, and and doing the research to understand the time period and people's attitudes and so on. So uh, some of it was simply oral history, uh, 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 talking to my aunt, talking to older relatives, uh, her brother, my, my uncle Sock, uh, was a fund of information. A lot of this information, of course, was also basically kind of like mythical or legendary and, and half made up and so on. Uh, some of it was accurate. I also, of course, ordered the capital case files from um, uh, uh, Ottawa National Library, National Archives, and I received 1,500 pages of trial transcripts and attendant information about, about the guys. Also, letters that they had written to the Governor General to an attempt, in an attempt to have their uh, sentences commuted. I also uh, received a copy of the diary uh, that George Hamilton kept all and printed all in caps about his conversion to Christianity via the Salvation Army and his pleas for for again uh, to have his his uh, uh, sentence commuted, uh, talking about the fact he was a father to uh, infant children. One, in fact, had just been born uh, the uh, a few days before he committed helped his brother uh, commit the horrible uh, crime that they committed. I went to Fredericton, I went to St. John, uh, New Brunswick, and I talked to everybody who had any kind of connection to, to the guys. The case was so infamous, so notorious, 
that the place where the murder uh, occurred ended up becoming uh, called Hammertown after the weapon that was used. Uh, and to this day, there are people in Fredericton that talk about Hammertown and don't know why. Don't know why it has that it has that uh, moniker. Um, I even received a letter from a police retired policeman who said who claimed uh, that his mother had attended the hangings in the barn because her father was was a policeman, and that she reached out and touched Rufus as he was on his way up the thirteen steps to the scaffold. I went to the prison. I stood in the cells where the guys were held, and and uh, it's still there. It's now a science museum. And my guide around the around the museum let me go into the cells but i told him i said don't you dare even think about closing that door don't you dare even think about it because it was already i was already feeling very freaked out about it so i got to stop talking but i'll just say that that firsthand research the oral testimony oh the other thing i did i read every single copy of the fredericton daily gleaner newspaper from january 1 1949 to uh, uh, August 1949, all of the records of the of the case, the crime, uh, the arrest, the trial, everything. And but the other really important thing about looking through the newspaper record was that the news the newspaper itself was a, was an archive of the racism that animated most uh, uh, New Brunswickers, most Fredericktonians. Yes, the crime that brothers committed was horrible. But definitely the fact that they were that they were part black, part Micmac, like me, meant that they were doomed. They were they would not have any any opportunity uh, to see any kind of commutation. And one last thing I've got to mention is uh, looking at the newspaper ads, the advertisements also said a lot about the culture, the local culture, the time period, and, and so on. And and one of the ads, I gotta I gotta throw this out and I'll stop talking. One of the ads was for polyhexamethylene new diopi. I'll say that once again. One of the ads was actually advertising polyhexamethylene new diopi, uh, which was a brand new product that had just been uh, had just been created as a result of the Second World War. And you will recognize it by its regular name, nylon. So there was a a, a women's dress shop that was actually advertising, ladies, come and get your your new stockings and polyhexamethylene new diopi, right? And of course, nylon, as you probably know, was a contraction for New York, London. That's how the name came. That's how the name came up. So anyway, sorry, uh, I just learned a lot doing that uh, doing that research. Um, thank you. There are actually all sorts of points in there that I would love to follow up on, but I'm going to let Clint have a have a stab at this before we well, continue on. You look at approaches to research. Uh, mine was really based on a method of teaching experiential learning. Um, and in teaching history, I'm always uh, governed by a line, notorious line from Stalin. Uh, one death is a tragedy, 10,000 deaths are a statistic. And, you know, if you start letting uh, people become numbers, we're in big trouble, no matter what you teach. So what I began to do is to allow the students provide them with an opportunity to identify with a single person, uh, a young person. In my case, it could be uh, young soldiers, or, you know, when you're teaching a Holocaust unit, um, you know, it could be a 13-year-old girl running for her life and so many people across Europe you can use. And then my job as the teacher is then to sort of plug that into the framework of the big picture as I teach the unit. So, you know, I might be teaching a unit on the Holocaust or the Second World War, they've got a person, a photograph, a name, a paragraph, and background. And then, you know, every few days as you teach different elements of the subject, you would give them another chunk of that person's life story. And in the end, they find out what happened to that person. Uh, whereas with the books on the First and Second World War, uh, these were simply names on the cenotaph. And uh, we had to do the research ourselves. And so this way, you know, the students got quite engaged with it. And many discovered uh, that they had relatives on the Sanitaf they didn't know about. Uh, they began to want to know more about their own family members. Uh, you know, many had a grandfather they barely got to know before he was gone. 
uh, and learning, and even in some cases, walking the ground he walked in Normandy at the age of 17 or 18, brought those students a lot closer to that grandfather. And of course, we did a lot of work with uh, Second World War veterans and became quite close with them, local uh, vets who would come into the classroom and talk to the kids. Um, ranging from, you know, combat veterans to, you know, a uh, group of students interviewed a woman who was a dancer in the entertainment branch, for example. So we had a wide range of people. Um, and, you know, the oral history is probably the most compelling, but uh, there's a danger it can also be the least accurate in some respects, and you have to be uh, wary of that. And you're also dealing with highly emotive material. And you've got to be careful as a teacher working with that as well. That's interesting what you're saying about it being highly emotive. You don't really think you don't really necessarily think about that when you're doing research, you know, re from, you know, from a, my point of view, research is, is fairly clinical, is fairly dry. But when you're starting to get into the first person stuff, you're really actually tapping into a whole area that's can be quite volatile, I would imagine. Oh, sure, particularly when you've got letters where it's, you could just feel the adrenaline shaking out of them in a trench while they're scratching this out with a pencil. Or poetry that some of them wrote that brought them quite close to, uh, you know, a young girl research. Hmm. Um, I think we have lost Clint for the moment, but that's okay. This will give us a good segue into, um, sort of a next question then Clinton was talking about the fact that a lot of the first person stuff is not necessarily accurate so I wanted to ask about where do you find you part of, some most of you sort of answered this a little bit already but where do you find your information is it libraries is it the internet is it interviews um, and is the inter, inter, internet a gold mine or is it a minefield if um, I don't know George do you want to start uh, sure. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and again, I appreciate uh, Clint's uh, answers uh, as well. Um, I just want to say, as I, as I launch into it, that we are living in a very weird moment uh, technologically in terms of communications uh, uh, in that uh, at our fingertips, thanks to Google, Wikipedia, and all the other wikis and so on, we have so much information readily available. The challenge now is to be able to interpret it appropriately and for that you need i think i would prescribe a critical consciousness and that critical consciousness in my opinion needs to be informed by old-fashioned close reading of old-fashioned history um and, and keeping in mind that histories can come from different perspectives tell different kinds of stories but if you don't have that if you don't have access to to standard historic histories, even if you want to question them and argue with them and debate their premises and so on, it's far easier than to get sucked down innumerable uh, rabbit holes uh, of disinformation, misinformation, mythologies of one sort or another that can be extremely damaging. And I'll just say, now that I've just turned 62, I don't mind saying that I've become a bit of a curmudgeon in listening to uh, current younger generations of reporters specifically CBC, uh, telling stories, reporting on stories without having any real adequate historical context. And I'll just give one quick example. A few nights ago, there was a discussion on the CBC Evening News, 6 p.m. News, World at 6, on Finland and the, and the uh, attitude that some Finns now have, thanks to the invasion of the Ukraine that Russia is undertaking, that they might want to join NATO. Uh, and, and I can't remember the reporter's name, but uh, there were a couple of clips of conversations with Finns um, uh, talking about why they might be interested now in, in, in pursuing NATO membership. And there was some discussion of the fact that Finland has, um, you know, for, in recent decades, uh, been essentially very uh, uh, non-committal to NATO and not interested in, in joining NATO and so on. And I waited and waited and waited for that reporter to mention the fact that Finland fought two wars with the Soviet Union uh, in 1940, 41, the first winter war, and then the war of the, of the continuation, 1944 to 45. In 1940, 41, they won by basically not losing any territory. 
And of course, they also won because Germany invaded the Soviet Union, and so Stalin had his hands busy on the, on the Eastern Front and had to leave Finland alone. But when they went back uh, to war with Finland in 45, they actually, this time, the Soviet Union won. They grabbed a chunk of territory. That war was settled finally by a peace treaty uh, where it was made very clear uh, to Finland that uh, they would have to remain non-aligned if they didn't want the Russian bear uh, uh, again uh, moving uh, into their into their country. So that's all, you know, I'll just say that I was disturbed that the reporter did not seem to know that information, even though it could easily have been found by Googling it. Uh, and that my guess is that the reason why that didn't happen is because the reporter did not understand the importance of that historical context. Uh, so I'm sorry for sounding like a curmudgeon, but I say for every single issue, for every single situation on the face of the earth today, there is a history that anybody who wants to be able to say anything sensible about it must know, must know, or, you know, just go and write fairy tales. Well, thank you, George. And it does, you're not being a curmudgeon. All opinions are valid. We're happy to hear them all. And uh, Clint, just to give you an update, since I know you disappeared for a little bit, the question we're currently talking about is where do you find your information, libraries and internet interviews, and whether or not the internet is a gold mine or a minefield. Um, so I'll let you think about that for a second. And then Leah, if you want to jump in. Uh, yes. And I, George, you're not a curmudgeon because I think the same thing that uh, that everything has this historical context. And before you write anything about a, a period of in time, uh, you have to do that groundwork of, of knowing what the context is that you're, that you're working in. Because it's like you're reaching back into history uh, to this other world. And the rules were different, the people were different, they, they, they were allowed to think different things or it was polite to think certain things and not right to think something else. Um, and, and so looking at a, an overview of a political history and a social history and a family history and a, a geographical history, you know, for places, you know, like Finland, where, where it comes down to territory, like sometimes what we know of a place now was not the place then. Um, and so uh, kind of having that wide approach to what is the worldview of, of, the, of the time and place and people that I'm looking at. Um, and I think, I think to do that, you have to look at a book. I have not found an internet source that does that in the same way that good old fashioned books do. Um, so I think there's, there's value in book and, and there's, there's great value in, in the amazing resources that are on the internet, but sometimes they are not vetted or um, they, anyone can write whatever they want on the internet in a different way that you can a, a book. Like if you write a book that's in the library, it means that you had a bunch of editors. It means that somebody else looked at it. It means that it has a huge bibliography at the end. You can, you can look at the bibliography at the end and go back yourself to those primary sources that are in the contextual history book that you're, that you're reading and, and make your own determinations on it as well. So, uh, so starting with that, that general history will lead you to some primary sources that can then give you further um, uh, research points and, and can, can take you to those um, voices and characters and unique perspectives and um, kind of smaller stories that are, that are what you're gonna create, what for me anyway, is what drama and writing is gonna be created from, are these the social history and the small moments that are like at the back of the Oxford history of Canada. Um, so, uh, but the Oxford history of Canada is a great place to start if you're, if you're like looking at upper Canada or lower Canada or out, out East or whatever. So especially for Canadian history. Um, and then in terms of the internet, like I, I'm old enough that when I went to university, the internet was not like the internet now. And you had to like order articles from from like some place in England and have them mailed to you, like a photocopy of them was mailed to you because like a PDF didn't exist. So, so now things are so much easier. Like most things are digitized, like most records from across the world have been digitized. So even if you're looking at something that's way outside of your geographical area, 
there's a good chance that that somewhere the primary source again or the letter the diary the information has been digitized and then you can access it most of the time for free if it's through a library so uh keeping your your library memberships up to date is a good idea when you're when you're researching um most library systems will allow you to enter into the academic library system which allows you to get all the academic articles through like the, the search portals and things so ask your local librarian to help you with that side of things um, but all of that can be accessed through the internet so that's incredibly valuable but uh so are books and for for historians i i i collect my my roommates hate me but i collect so many books i have so many books because as a historian i want the history that was written in 1960 i want to look at that because they were closer to the event than i am now and there'll be something interesting there even though it's going to be clouded by like colonialism and racism and misogyny and you know political you know problems and it's gonna be clouded by all those things but there'll be something good there um so going to your used bookstore and looking for old history books is is really valuable as well I love that idea about the fact that even though there's all these overlying layers of misogyny and racism, there's still sort of that kernel of truth there somewhere. If you can, yeah, find. they are they they are close. Like when you're looking at history, you want to look for those people who are writing about it who are closer to the event than we are. So even you know if if I'm I write about the 1800s a lot or the early 1900s. So so a history book that's written at the turn of the century you know, might be garbage in terms of how we think about the world now and its politics and the way we treat like women and people of color. And uh, it's gonna be very problematic in a lot of ways, but they are technically closer to the event than we are. So so seeing through that, there, there is something there that is closer to the primary source. Hmm. Fascinating. Clint, why don't yeah, you- Yeah, I uh, agree with- Oh no. Uh, Leah, so much. And I know my house looks like there was an explosion in a museum and a bookstore. Uh, I'll give a shout out to the very public library. I did a lot of research and writing there, as did my students. And, you know, there's an assumption today that you can get everything online. You can't. And there are, you know, microfish in the local libraries that are digitized. Uh, as far as books go, you know, those square things of paper and then all my students would look at that as well. Surfing the internet doesn't feel like work to them. But a couple hours can go by and they've got nothing to show for it. Whereas if they spent a half hour that big scary book, they'd be much further ahead. And, you know, we tend to push that on them. Um, Andy, as far as the internet goes, yeah. Uh, as we began our research, very few uh, records or official documents were or, uh, digitized and what was available through official government sites you had to order and my school year would be over by the time they arrived the kids would be gone and we couldn't afford them anyway uh, there are sites like the Canadian Virtual War Memorial that use a lot of our research to launch with but it's very strength is also its weakness anyone can contribute which is great but it also means that well-meaning people contribute erroneous material you know they got the wrong dave brown for example that they're looking for uh and you know we found that be because we didn't have access or a lot of things weren't available that it drove us to using uh, more primary sources in the community talking to people in our case the siblings of the soldiers who were killed were still in the community and were delighted to talk to us in many cases share with us which was incredible trust now they didn't know what a scam was but they would share photographs and letters and so on and then of course after the book gets out you smoke out more stories then we're getting phone calls from around the world and solving real twilight zone mysteries and so on and that allowed us being low budget to sell out small uh, print runs and improve the book and develop it uh, so yeah the other Internet isn't a be all and end all. Interviews were also huge with us. Again, the most compelling uh, Second World War vets. 
uh, you know, there was a D-Day vet who stormed Juno Beach who came in. It was on a D-Day anniversary. And after he talked to the kids, Gord Leach was interviewed by uh, CTV. And he said, well, you, you know, you were at D-Day and you talked to these kids about what was it like. He said, they knew more about D-Day than I did. You know, I was following from the man in front of me with a rifle trying not to get killed. He didn't know about deception plans and um, double, triple cross and you know, spy systems and all this sort of thing. Um, and, you know, the students did. And that became very uh, important with us. And as time passed on, you know, my students ended up singing at the funerals of uh, many of these uh, treasured friends that we made. And then, of course, we made friends in Europe and among students there and so on. And, uh, it, it was quite something. But yeah, I know there's that feeling out there that the internet uh, has everything. And uh, you learn very quickly that it doesn't. Um, um, oh, go ahead. I'll, yeah, I'll just I'll just jump in and say that there's another point we have to keep in mind about the internet, which is that first of all, it's a great surveillance device, uh, and and that is absolutely true. So it's it's uh, possible that one may actually end up uh, looking up things that bring one to the attention of persons who may look askance at what you are planning to research or look at what and so on. Uh, the other great problem with the internet is that it's so easy to delete things uh, and for information to go missing and for facts to disappear. Um, I am someone uh, who grew up with um, George Orwell in uh, 1984, uh, also of, of course uh, Fahrenheit 451 which is another reason why I hold dear to the idea of the book, simply because it's harder to delete the book. You can burn it, but it's much harder to delete its contents, uh, which can happen. Of course, you think about, for instance, the Iraq invasion, another illegal invasion, I happen to, uh, to think it was, um, and the hundreds of thousands of emails uh, between the George Bush White House and, and George W. Bush White House and others that just went missing. Just delete it, boom, gone. And so a lot of the thinking and rationales for that illegal invasion that ended up costing tens of thousands of lives, if not hundreds of thousands of lives, uh, can never actually be prosecuted in terms of potential war crimes in that case, because all the evidence was simply made to disappear. So while I totally agree with the idea of the internet being a great resource, I again uh, feel that it's extremely essential for folks to go into the archives and go into the libraries and get hold of the actual paper, the actual paper trail uh, for whatever it is that you're interested in researching. Um, the French theorist, Michel Foucault, you always got to mention Foucault just as you always got to mention Marx, but Foucault said, uh, that a true revolutionary is against is against the rule of until now. I'll say that again because it's actually very profound. A true revolutionary is against the rule, R-U-L-E, -E, of until now. What he means by that with that statement is, as soon as you say until now, and then complete the sentence, you are defeated because what Foucault is signaling is the necessity for revolutionaries or radicals or activists to know the history of the struggle. That the struggle is not new. It didn't just happen yesterday. It didn't just happen today. It's not just until now that things were possible. Things were possible before and things were done before that you need to know if you're going to try to have a successful radical campaign or social activist campaign now. So that there should not be any uh, disjunction between, for instance, uh, activism around George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis in 2020 and the earlier civil rights movement, Black Panther Party activism and so on. You can say the same thing about indigenous activism. Uh, uh, before before uh, Idle No More, there was the American Indian Movement. There was the standoff at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. And so many, there was the campaign against 
Pierre Elliott Trudeau's white paper in 1969-1970. So there's not there's nothing that does not have a historical uh, 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 center that it is incumbent upon anyone who wants to think about that period to know thoroughly as much as possible. One last thing, I'm going to shut up. I got to quote Desmond Morton. Because you can never have a discussion about Canadian history and not quote Desmond Morton. But Desmond Morton said, when we were having coffee at the Tim Hortons, he said something so profound to me, and I think about it all the time. He said, and Leah uh, touched on this earlier. He said, over our Tim Hortons coffee, people in the past are different from us. They think differently. That is so profound, and that causes me to remain humble and to not get on my moral high horse. Like, I'm so much superior to those folks in the past because I'm so much more progressive and liberal than they were. No, they had a different set of historical circumstances that they were negotiating with what they knew. Just as people looking back at us 100 years from now are going to say, didn't they understand they were in the middle of an environmental catastrophe? Why weren't they doing something about it? Right? So... We're going to be judged harshly by history, just as we think we can judge others harshly. So I think that, that Foucault's comment also asks for some humility uh, uh, in terms of how we look at, at persons in the past, even if we want to oppose uh, things that they did and things that they said and things that they thought. And I just wanted to jump on something that George said. George had started, uh, you know, his answer by talking about like go to the archives, go to the library, and you know, go to the places. Uh, the other thing is that they want you to go there. They want to help you with their research. You know, all of those librarians and archivists and and folks who are working at research centers, they are they are so excited when you bring them your nerdy idea about this thing that happened in 1937 and you don't know anything about it. And they really, they are generous and they want to help you do that research and solve that historical mystery. Um, and we're so lucky, you know, in Canada to have that a lot of these institutions have great funding so that we have amazing archives. You know, in Ontario, we have the Archives of Ontario, which is at uh, around York University. Um, and you can uh, you can go there just as a, as a regular person, you can get a membership, um, it's free. Uh, and you can go and and use their their research collections. Again, a lot of that stuff is is digitized, so you can kind of look at stuff online and then see what it is that you want to see in person, and go there and get out the microfilm machine and scroll through and and find the things that you want to research. Um, and then you can ask to view the the special collections as well if if something that you really want to see is is kind of hidden away and the other in the other space, uh, you can make those appointments and, and ask to see that that real thing. Um, so whether it's your local library, like the Barry Library or the archives or the archives of your city, um, there's Simcoe County archives, uh, those those archivists and librarians uh, are excited by the work that that writers and creative people are doing with historical materials and they want to help you. Yeah, Leah, if I may, uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, also satin and a sense of place. And I've been fortunate to take many students over to Europe and walk the ground of the battlefields, uh, to stand on the beach at Dieppe and you can see the cliffs and the shale, and then read an excerpt from a local man, Jack Fulton, who uh, landed in that maelstrom. You know, and remember the Dutch bus driver saying, it might not have taken that beach in 1942, but sure have that now because every Canadian takes a stone away. But uh, you go over to Normandy, uh, a similar story, not just Juno Beach or want, seeing the wheat fields that vulnerable Canadian soldiers had to wade through to get it dug in German positions where they were decimated, but walking through a cemetery. And uh, to see a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery is a very, very powerful thing. I think it was King George when uh, Kind Cot, the world's biggest one open, said that it was the biggest statement against war imaginable. And you know, to have to walk through that and you just see this forest of stones and then you see the individual stone with the name, the youthful age. And then if the family had the cash, 
they could put a personal epitaph below that. And each one just shatters it. And my students are there kneeling at the grave of the 16 year old killed at Vimy or whatever. And it is a very powerful experience. And, you know, as writers, many of you know this too, how a city can become so um, essential to a story, whether you're looking at Berlin in the 20s or uh, really any time period. Uh, but that sense of place can still be quite evocative. Thank you, everybody. That you guys are wonderful panelists. I don't even have to do anything. You guys just keep keep chatting, which is great. And you've kind of already segued into our next area, which is so. How do you research for a specific time period or location? So how much are you looking for? I mean, there's so much that that you're researching. You're researching how people speak, how they dress, how they move around, where they live. Um, how much of this do you include? Are you conscious of that when you're researching or does it come out when you're writing? I'm curious if anybody wants to respond to that. Well, I think I, I can approach it as a teacher. Uh, you know, that German historical expression, zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. And it comes from just sort of a barrage of different stimuli whether it's print, letters, diaries, um, uh, in some cases, documentary film where it exists, uh, primary sources being essential. And sort of trying to take all of that in. Uh, I think, uh, Leah, you might remember Alex Dole, for example, uh, you know, he, they're looking at an earlier time period, you'd say, well, you know, what was the biggest influence on people? And he would think, well, what were they reading? You know, today you would look at the young person's social media. Um, you know, I would have students and I could be in St. Petersburg or Berlin. And, you know, they would make contact with another person. They'd simply say, you know, what music do you listen to? Um, and I suppose music or uh, writing. Uh, and for my students, it's hard to imagine people of deep religious faith. And you know, the powerful influence of religion on so much of our history and how that shaped uh, the way you saw and experienced the world. And that's difficult for a, a modern uh, teenager to understand. Um, I think uh, you asked about like, how do you research for, for that specific time period? And I think every time period is different. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at the mid 20th century, then yeah, you've got, you could have video footage of things. You could have audio, you'll have newspapers, you'll have uh, all the, the thousands of books that people have written about that time period. And, and the further back you go, then you're gonna have different sources, different historical sources, different primary sources that are gonna dictate uh, how you do that research. Um, so for, for my play, Mary of Shandy Bay, it, it takes place starting in 1828 and covers about the next 10 years. And so there's no video, there's no audio. I, I have no idea how these people sounded. Uh, I don't really know, like there's no, there's no photographs even. So you don't even know what a person looked like from a photo. So uh, again, I take that kind of wide approach of, uh, so I looked at the Oxford Illustrated History of Canada and I had a vague idea about what Upper Canada is and, and who's there and why and whatever. Um, I'm gonna look at, uh, because I'm writing a, a theater piece, I wanna know what people dressed like, what are the, what are the fashions of the time? Um, particularly as a feminist historian, it's, it's more important. It, I, it seems to me that there's more, uh, diversity in what people wear when you're looking at women's fashion rather than men's. Men's kind of have like pants and jackets and hats all the time. Um, but women have this, this really incredible diverse spread of clothes through the 19th century. And, and to me, that then tells you a lot about how a woman behaves. So if you're looking at a time period where they have very tight corsets and really strict clothing that restricts how a person moves, and that's going to tell you a lot about how that woman lives her daily life, that she's not shot down on the floor scrubbing it, you know, if she's got that, that corset on. Um, 
looking at what people ate. I always find it really fascinating to find what people eat. Uh, where do they go? What are they reading? As Clint said, you know, we look at social media and stuff like what, what are they taking in in their lives in terms of pop culture or culture? So what are they reading? What are they listening to? What plays are they going to? Um, and then uh, because I don't have the sources of, of audio and video, I just have the written word. So I had Mary O'Brien's letters, which to me read like a Jane Austen novel. Like it had that that long phrasing and and like incredible language and the way that people wrote then is very different than how we write now because paper was so expensive another thing that the research will tell you is how expensive paper is and so they you know they they scratch tiny little lines on every inch of that paper and the line that you're putting down on that piece of paper in 1828 has been thought out and crafted and curated before you put it down on a piece of paper. And so it is more like an, an closer to a novel than natural speech, but it can be a basis for dialogue and a basis for natural speech. So I, I, that's where I get that voice is through, through the written word. Um, but I think all of, all of those things are, are inspiration. To, to help you dramatize and fictionalize and, and make your own. Um, but it's, uh, you kind of have to go wide, cover everything, and then narrow in on what is it that you really need or want to know to, for the story that you want to tell. Um, I have a question for you before George jumps in. Um, so when you, you were fairly restricted in your sources of research, so how much do you think that then fed into the the writing the final product of 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 the project um i i wouldn't say that i was restricted in my sources of research i would say that i had like i had her diaries to work from but then i did a lot of reading around it all so like yes i have this primary source of her diaries but i had all of the historical context research the, the political arguments of the day, the newspapers of the day, like looking at maps all the time of like, where's what and where did it go and how long did it take to get there? And um, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, there's, there's research that you can do about um, uh, the, the different groups that are living in, in different places. So things that might not make it into the play are not things that Mary O'Brien is talking about, but impact her worldview. So, so you want to know all those things. Um, and then I, I also looked at other people who are similar. So in Ontario, we have a great history of, of ladies who wrote things down in the mid 19th century to talk about, you know, pioneering through Upper Canada. So, you know, I could look at Susanna Moody. I looked at Catherine Parr Trail. I looked at uh, Anna Langton. I looked at, um, you know, all those people who are, who are kind of living similar lives, again, as inspiration. Uh, so that I can continue to flesh out um, what what this one woman's experience was that I was looking at. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think, again, like it's not all of that's going to make it into the thing that you're writing, but it's it continues to inform your worldview and continues to flesh out uh, that story that you're that you're telling. OK, thank you, George. Why don't you go ahead? Well, um, I'll just talk about the, uh, uh, the process of creating my second novel, uh, which is titled The Motorcyclist. And the impetus for that, the catalyst for that, was uh, my father's passing away, age 70, in 2005. And he left me only one thing, his diary from 1959. And attached to that, attached to the diary was a note uh, for George, so he will understand. And and uh, uh, it took me a long time to be able to read, read that diary that he left me. Uh, when he passed away, we were a little bit estranged uh, for lots of reasons. And, and uh, so it was very emotional. In fact, his passing away hit me much, much worse than I thought, uh, than I ever thought it would, uh, when it actually happened. But when I started to read the diary, which he did keep for most of that year, uh, 59, the year I was conceived, so kind of important, 
uh, a keepsake for me. Um, it it uh, revealed to me a man I had not known, a person who was uh, full of of uh, uh, lack of self confidence, a person who lacked confidence, um, who really didn't have a, a strong sense of direction, uh, who had the inklings of becoming an artist, a painter. Um, and, and I did see evidence of that as a boy, that, that he could certainly paint, uh, and had, uh, and had artistic skill. And, and, uh, and then I, I realized that I should write a novel based on, on the diary. And, and uh, the focal year was 1959 and the diary is about this young black man who has a motorcycle, big purple BMW motorcycle. And he's always turned out extremely well on this motorcycle. And he knows that uh, the women of Halifax, black and white, are looking at him as he zips along the, the city streets in his nice, big, purple, brand new BMW motorcycle. And, and, uh, and so the diary talks about his romances and his, and his conquests, in quotation marks, uh, and, and, uh, but also his frustrations. And, and what I came to understand was this very interesting dilemma that my father faced and my protagonist, Carl, a black, also faces uh, in the novel based on a diary, which is the impact of class transition uh, affecting his romances in Halifax in 1959, and that the crucial year was 1949. And, and, uh, and I'll explain why. Because up until 1949, most black people in Nova Scotia were of the same class background, men and women. They were, uh, again, lumpen proletarian. They were uh, service uh, class workers, paid very poorly, and, and more or less segregated as well uh, in, that, in that capacity. Uh, and so when young men, young black men and women thought about family formation, there probably wasn't a whole lot of concern about whether it's going to be any kind of like class uh, division, uh, because everybody's basically the same class background, with some with some distinction for ministers and a few teachers would be more or less on the verge of the middle class, right? But everybody else would be the same class background. But two things happened in 1949 that ended up having a huge impact on my protagonist and my real life father's romantic opportunities. And that was the first thing that happened was black women were allowed to become nurses in 1949. The fact once once that happened, there began to be the, the development, at least for black women in Nova Scotia, of, a, of access to a more middle class bourgeois lifestyle. That meant they could be much more selective in who they might choose to want to marry or date or have a child with or children with or what have you. Um, the men were still essentially working class, but the women, those who were becoming nurses or teachers, now could have a little bit more uh, leeway in terms of who they might think of actually marrying as potential mate. The other thing that happened in 1949 uh, is that uh, NATO was created and Canada was part of NATO. What that meant was American naval vessels were coming to Halifax, which is essentially the number one naval port on the North Atlantic is Halifax, none other, it's Halifax, Mile Deep Harbor, and so it never freezes. So now NATO uh, vessels, including American vessels, could visit Halifax. And on one occasion, my father was, uh, and my protagonist was very interested in a, in a particular black working class woman who he thought he wouldn't have any trouble having a relationship with and, and that, cause he had grade 10 and he had a job and he had a motorcycle. So there shouldn't be any difficulty since she's of essentially a lower class, he thinks to him. But he didn't, he didn't plan on, on the NATO ships visiting in 1959, including an aircraft carrier, which disgorged into Halifax, 4,000, yes, 4,000 lusty sailors. And in fact, there's a photograph I found of that actual uh, aircraft carrier 
birthed in Halifax Harbor in 1959 with those 4,000 sailors spelling out on the, on, the air, on the aircraft carrier's deck, hello Halifax, and they meant it. So those, when those sailors came off that ship and into Halifax looking for young women, suddenly the young black women had an opportunity potentially to find a mate amongst these uh, well-off, in comparison with the black Nova Scotian men, these well-off American sailors who could carry them off to the land of Broadway and Hollywood, movie stars and milkshakes, uh, and so on. And so even though my, my protagonist and my real life, of course, father, may have thought that, well, we've got it made, we've got, we've got so many things going for us, we shouldn't have any trouble finding a mate. Actually, there was a lot of trouble because of the class division which had begun in the community and the fact that that black women had uh, more prospects uh, in terms of American sailors, but also West Indian students. Because the other huge impact on him, on my protagonist, as on my father, was the fact that in 1955, Canada dropped its anti-black immigration rules, but replaced the anti-black immigration rules with classist and sexist immigration rules, which meant that black men were allowed to come to Canada, but only as university students. And so that meant that the black men who were coming to Canada in 1955 and 1959, when my father's trying to find somebody to marry, um, are, are university students who are going to become professionals, doctors, lawyers, engineers. Talk about class division. And when these guys end up in Halifax, um, uh, you know, very few of them are going to end up marrying or even dating white women. So they're probably going to be looking at the local black women who are themselves now in university studying to be nurses, studying to be teachers, right? So, so now the black, local black Nova Scotian women, again, now have yet another opportunity for class ascension by marrying a West Indian guy who's on his way to becoming a professional. And if he decides to marry uh, that woman and take her back home uh, to uh, Jamaica or Trinidad or Barbados, they're gonna be in the upper class in those, in those islands which are still colonies of Great Britain until 1962. So in other words, I'm sorry for the long answers to the great question, but it's simply this. Um, I had my father's primary document, the diary, to inform me. But then, in terms of looking at the actual uh, 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 political and economic and social uh, realities facing the Black Nova Scotian community in that day, I saw a much bigger picture, bigger than my father could have realized then. He knew he had trouble because he had competition from the West Indian students. He had competition from the American sailors. He, could, he knew that, he could write about that, but he couldn't, he did not have the distance to understand that this was a process that had, been, that had really started in 1949 when he was all of 14 years old. Uh, and that it was, but it was going to really impact him by the time he was in his early 20s and, and thinking about settling down. That is actually a beautiful example of the importance of sort of the wider historical context and, you know, how everything in the world is going to affect your characters. I, I love that example. That is very well done. Um, okay, so we are running out of time, surprisingly, and we still have a lot of questions to get to. So um, let's see, where should we go? Let's go with when to say when. How do you know when to stop? Um, Clint, do you want to start with that? Well, in my case, I wanted it done before all the kids were gone and graduated. Uh, we didn't have to worry about the money running out. We didn't have any. Uh, but truthfully, you never stop. Uh, you know, in history, you don't finish a story. You just start one. And as soon as we put something out there, the phones would ring from around the world. Um, more primary sources would emerge from, you know, uh, buried drawers and attics and so on. And on and on it went. And, uh, you know, we tried to honor that and uh, update and uh, keep moving with it. I mean, I can understand why Francis Ford Coppola kept making Apocalypse Now. You know? Just wanted to get it right. And, you know, in history, you think that it's done. It's not, you know. 
It was only a few months ago, for example, that war diaries of 12th SS were found in the Czech Republic. That's the unit that fought the Canadians in Normandy. You know, we didn't know what was going on from their point of view until quite recently. And for a long time, there was a lot of mythology about uh, the progress of the campaign in Normandy. But, you know, the history changes all the time too, doesn't it? Hmm. George or Leah, who wants to jump in? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, uh, you know, when to say when, I think that- I don't want to talk, I just want to hear oh, this. There's, oh, there's stop, give me a goddamn thing. Oh. Hold on a second. Uh, I think that there's such a thing as uh, like too little research where, where you're not giving yourself a broad enough perspective on the world. If you're, if you're only looking at uh, a minimal amount of sources, then you're going to miss all these other perspectives and voices. And especially as a dramatist, you need to be representing both sides of the argument. So you have to, you have to research enough that you've got both sides of your, of the conflict that you, that you feel like you've got a balanced worldview and perspective of, of uh, the story that you're telling. Um, but you could research forever. You could research for a hundred years and never finish. And then you never write the thing that you're trying to write. So at, at some point you, you have to say, okay, I have enough to start. Um, I, I understand the worldview. I, I understand the conflict of what I'm talking about. I've got enough. I know enough about this, about who this character is going to be that I can get inside their head and start writing. Um, and, and the research will always be there. So, you know, if you start writing and you, you figure out, you know, half an hour in that you're like, well, I don't know what spoon she used, then you can go and look it up and you can figure it out and solve, solve that mystery. Um, but, but you can't let the not knowing of every single detail be an impediment to starting the writing. Um, because research is a great procrastination tool as well. It's a great way to, to, to not start writing. Um, so, uh, so always looking for the, for the chance, do I know enough now to, to get started? Um, and then as Clint said, the research then never ends. Like I, I wrote this play four years ago and I still research it. You know, there's still more things that I want to know and like, oh, well, maybe the next time it comes back, I'll, I'll have more information to, to include because it's, you know, plays are more ephemeral than, than a novel or a book, you know, like I can, I can keep changing it and I can keep adding to it. I'm still looking for this canoe landing in Holland Landing to see where they, they set their canoe off. And every time I drive to Newmarket, I drive down the road to look for it because I haven't found it yet. So uh, you, it'll keep on going forever, um, but you cannot let it stop you from writing. George, do you want to jump in? I think you're muted. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, uh, great answers once again. And, and I think I'll just actually just uh, read uh, uh, this little scene uh, from uh, my uh, play and also opera libretto on Pierre uh, Trudeau which actually um, uh, the book all begins with this, uh, I think actually a very, uh, should be very famous photograph. That's Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson and the future Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and the future Prime Minister John Turner and the future Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau uh, at the swearing in of the cabinet in 1965, by the way, as the three wise men from Montreal uh, came to Ottawa and and joined uh, Pearson's cabinet in 1960 in 1965. But the piece I want to read is an is an invented piece. Um, it's set in Gatineau, Quebec, 16th of April, 1968. So Trudeau has just become the leader. Pierre has just become the leader of the Liberal Party as of April 6, 1968. And I imagine him standing in the Gatineau Park, imagining what his life is going to be now. He's age 49 and he's about to be and he is about to be elected prime minister in his own right as of June 25th, 1968. Uh, so, and it rhymes, by the way. So here it is. This April 1968, these charted stars narrate my fate. I become prime minister now to headline a carnival show 
and prostitute my privacy to face and I publicity, mother's milk of all politics, alcohol for alcoholics, and roll out finest folder roll, speeches as solid as a whole, branding Pierre a Piero, an idio on radio, a metaphysical misfit, a blank-faced black comic wit, elastic plastic alabast, my image will be telecast, in vapid metamorphoses, evaporating by degrees, or played as eunuch or as whore, betrayed by sketchy metaphor, till I'm scorned, condemned, tarred as liar, a hypocrite in Anglo hire. And it goes on. But the reason why I wanted to, to uh, uh, use that to answer that question about when to stop is Sometimes you you do have a, a place to stop. And for me, of course, it was Pierre Trudeau's demise uh, in 2000. It was a pretty handy way to, to bring that story to, to an end. Um, and and uh, in ending The Motorcyclist, uh, the story based on my father's diary, I actually end with the birth of a child. And, and uh, who in real life is me. Uh, but, of course, in the novel is... is uh, the child, which is going to allow the protagonist, Carl Black, to make some decisions uh, about what he might do now for the rest of his life, uh, now that he knows he's a father. And, and uh, similarly, my opera, Beatrice Chancy, ends with the hanging of the protagonist. Pretty good. I'm, I know it was good to have, have her hanged. Similarly, the same thing for George Rufus Hamilton in my novel, George and Rue. Uh, you know, it comes to an end basically uh, with with their with their deaths, and then of course the community reaction, the black community reaction to the loss of those of those two young men. Um, so, I, I agree with the idea that that nothing really comes to an end, uh, because even when you think there's an end, for instance, uh, I can think of the patriation of the Constitution. Pierre Trudeau himself thought as of April 17, 1982, that it was now settled. The Constitution is done. We've got the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, although Quebec didn't sign it. The whole thing is finished now. It's done. It's a done deal. Sorry, it's not. Sooner or later, that document's going to be reopened because there are things in it that are not quite correct for a whole lot of categories of Canadians. And sooner or later, it will be amended. Uh, either through the uh, amendment amendment formula that's that's included in the charter, or not uh, by some other means. So there's nothing that's actually settled. People thought with the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act 1965 that now, hey, you know what? The movement succeeded. Black people can now vote in the American South. You know, and eventually that helps Barack Obama become the first black president of the United States. The reaction to that? The conservative U.S. Supreme Court then begins to water down all the protections for voting rights until we have the spectacle now of Republican-dominated legislatures in various American states actually rolling back uh, voting rights provisions in order to make it less possible for Democrats or another black president potentially to ever be elected. So nothing is, nothing is ever done. Nothing is ever completed. People who feel that they have won their liberty had better be careful because it can always be whittled away and taken away again, slowly but surely with the right arguments being made. Uh, so history, unfortunately, is the force that never ends. It never ends. And it's the job of everybody who wants peace and justice and equality to always be on guard to defend those qualities and to argue for them consistently or they will be lost. Um, I, and I think from a writing point of view, I think I love Leah's idea of, of the playwright where you can continually be changing your piece of work to sort of adapt and change to history as it changes. Um, so we have come to 8.30 and we didn't get to all our questions, but uh, thank you. That was wonderful conversation. You all are a wealth of information on research and I feel we could have you know, benefited from more time as always. Um, but I am going to pass it over to Linda now, and she will take over. 
Hello. Um, so we have an opportunity right now for open mic. So, uh, and George already gave us a kind of a little start there with his reading. Is there anyone here who uh, has anything they'd like to read? I'm just gonna shift my thing around here so I can see if you're saying yes. I know we've got some writers here, so. Nope, no one's jumping to it. <laughs> and that's okay. We've had a, a, a really great discussion tonight. Um, I almost had something for us. Um, but I couldn't quite get the ending. I've got a poem and I'm not really much of a poet, but every now and then when stuff happens in life and I get all emotional, that's when the poems come out. Just write like a mad woman. Um, so I'll, I'll take us to, to a close then. Um, but before we do that, we've got some really great events coming up. Um, Performance Skills uh, for Writers Part 2 is coming up March, uh, Oh, I don't have the date. Is it the 30th. 30th, Colleen? Yeah. Yeah. So March 30th. So it's for writers, both experienced and new, who no longer want to feel timid and unsure when standing before a crowd of, of even our peers. Uh, our instructor is a voice coach uh, and veteran professional actor, singer, and director, Deborah Joy, who recently worked on The Handmaid's Tale and Star Trek Discovery. Um, she's been teaching voice in George. Uh, sorry, at George Brown College Theatre School in Toronto since 1998. Um, so sign up today to develop a vocal confidence and presence and discover what makes a compelling reading to hone your vocal skills and shine in the world. Um, maybe what I will do right now is I'm going to add the little Eventbrite um, sign up sheet in the chat in case anyone wants to, to grab that. There we go. Um, it's on our website, um, and it's it. Uh, we'll be adding it shortly to our Facebook page. And our next uh, word up is Thursday, April fourteenth. It's the poetry panel. Um, we have Christian Bach, who's the author of, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Unoya from 2001, a best-selling work of experimental literature, which has gone on to win the Griffin Prize for Poetic Excellence. Bach is currently working on the Xenotext, a project that requires him to encipher a poem into the genome of a bacterium capable of surviving in any inhospitable environment. Um, I encourage you to look him up on YouTube. Christian Bach is a really, inter really interesting poet and uh, performance artist. Um, and look for more poems as we book them. We've, we had a few cancellations, unfortunately. So, um, so we'd like to close off by thanking our amazing panelists. Um, you, you gave us a fantastic evening. Um, please sign up for our newsletter at wordupberry.com if you want to get the Zoom links. Uh, for the next event. Um, thanks to Rhubarb Media for hosting our website and check energy.ca for Zoom hosting, but we are seeking a new Zoom host. So if you know of anyone or you are someone, uh, let us know. And thanks to the City of Barrie and Experience Simcoe for their support. And thanks Word Uppers for showing up. Yeah, thanks for coming everybody. It's a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys. Thank you, you, were, so you were fantastic tonight. Oh, thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>